from one of the librarians here. Um, I'm glad you came. Is this anyone's first time in this library? Well, that's, that's great to hear. I'm glad you're coming back. We have a lot to offer. Um, we are happy to offer these programs that we are provided with by David Wilson and by John Denmer. They are assets to the Nutley community. They're assets for our library. And they're here to share their love and knowledge of Nutley with you as well. Um, they're going to be talking about this walk that they did this past summer about Northwest Nutley. They had over 70 people following them around on this walk through town. And in October, we'll have another program. Is it the 75th anniversary? 80th anniversary of the Essex Film Club that John is doing with Don Lee. And they're going to be showing some old clips that they have found that were shown at the theater. So that's something to look forward to. And again, I have some event calendars on the piano here if you want to find out more about that. And let's get this program started. Hmm. Okay, thank you, Jeannie. Thanks for having us. And we thank the library for having us uh, back here quarterly. So <laughs> what we're doing tonight, we're going to be filming, just so everybody knows, we try to film all our events so that we can put them on YouTube so that those who are not in the area or can't make it, it'll be available for them to see. So if you can hold your questions till the end, it will do Q and A at the end. That way we keep the continuity of the uh, filming going on. There's Andy Conti's uh, in the back there helping us out here tonight. We thank him for that. Uh, before we start though, we would like to just uh, acknowledge the passing of uh, Dorothy Greengrove. She was a very active historical uh, person here in town, did a lot with the Kings of Manor. Uh, the Girl Scouts she was involved with on the Historical Preservation Committee here in town and just gave a lifetime of her lifetime into uh, keeping history alive in Nutley there. So she was kind of a forerunner to a lot of people and inspired a lot of people too. So uh, we do acknowledge that. And we have some family here tonight too. So our sympathies are to you. Okay, so what we're going to be talking about tonight is uh, this started as our, our walk that we did for the farmer's market. And we try to do at least one of those every season for them. And we were starting to get a little bored with the walks, always going in the same direction. So we talked about it. Let's go a different way. So we started looking at the maps and looking at our books and looking at everything we had. And we found the northwest quadrant of Nutley had a lot. It was like really steeped in history. And as we kept going more and more on the map, we ended up with 20 points of interest, which was way beyond what we expected to have. But it really worked out well. And it's kind of a mixture of churches, uh, housing development, industrial area, and some historical buildings, and some parkland. So it's a real mix, uh, and it gives us a good understanding of how Nutley developed. And that's one of the things that is the kind of the purpose of what we're doing when we do these talks. There's a lot of people that are newer to Nutley, maybe, maybe they just moved here, moved here maybe 10 or 15 years ago, and they want to know more about the history of Nutley and what it is doing for, or how it got to where it's at, and what made Nutley so great and keeps it great. And we think that history, development, early development in the town, all the work that the people did, the different developers, how they made the town what it is, from our parklands to our layouts of our neighborhoods, to our industry, to everything that just keeps Nutley you know, what it is. So that's one of the main purposes of this. So we're gonna start, uh, we're gonna do, you wanna say anything else before we get going? So the main thing we're gonna talk about is a lot of what William Lambert did. William A. Lambert was a architect who started in uh, Long Island and also here in New Jersey, and he was very active in Nutley, lived here for a number of years, and he was a big, big part of development. So we're gonna highlight his work as we find it uh, throughout the show, it'll be uh, in there. So, on with the show. So this is the very first place that we started. This is on Franklin Avenue. Uh, right uh, to the right of the Pancake Palace and Chickalini's right in that quadrant there. And this is the, a Lambert building that was put up as a, an investment building. He built it for businesses, had two apartments above it, and two stores below. So the format we're gonna follow today is we're gonna show you a picture of what it looks like today, and then we're gonna show the next couple of pictures will be what it looked like 100 years ago. So that's gonna be the format. We think it's, it's a pretty good format. So. Uh, some of you, this is where Custody Caters is now, and uh, Bon Choy Chicken is in there now. And those have been around for a while, blue ribbon, wallpaper, and paint, 
was there with Eddie and Richie. That's my mom worked there. And there was a fellow on the walk who had worked there also. And later on, Mike Ryder had that paint store there also. So that was a, a really long-term operation there with the paint store. So let's see what it looked like a while back. Okay, and that's when it was built. Still looks pretty similar. We have a shoemaker going here, and then it really does, we can't quite make out what that is there. But all here is all still the same. And the building was sold in about 1935. Lambert finally sold the building off, may have been after his death, and it was bought by another person for like $6,000. So it was a pretty good deal back then, a nice commercial building. And it's still you know, in pretty decent shape and still looks good. And this one, we don't have a today picture because you should all know this one. It's the <laughs> Nutley Wine Shop by Wright Nutley Liquors. Mike Martin owns that. So that was in a lot of different um, formats, but this was when it was the uh, central garage. And we see some great old cars on the left there and in the back. And we have the fuel pumps that were in the front here. We have a trolley track going across the front here. And mom is up here watching the kids roller skate. So there's quite a bit going on in this picture. It's kind of a fun picture that we had there because it had a lot of history of the, uh, the car garage there and the conversion that it went through over the years. But it still like, really looks good. Okay, to... this, uh, this is one of my favorite buildings in town and we all recognize it, uh, Corner of High and uh, Franklin. This is a William Lambert building, but it didn't originally start out this way. Um, this building uh, was one story less. It was built in 1904, the original structure, but uh, the, the Masons, uh, it was a Masonic hall, so the Masons, when they met there, they would occasionally show films, and films back then were very flammable. So in 1910, they were showing a film, and it caught fire. And it was such a bad fire that uh, there were almost several deaths. Actually, uh, uh, some ladies actually had to jump from what would be the second floor window down to the open arms of men below. Uh, to save them. So, uh, after the fire happened, I'm, I'm sorry, this is prior to, this is prior to when uh, the third story was added. And this building's had a lot of uh, things in it. It had the A&P, Morris's Confectionery, uh, there was ice cream store in there, I think Records Realty was in there, but it's just a lovely structure. But after the fire, Lambert came back and he said, was, his offices were right up the street a little bit, and he decided that he would put a third floor on that building, so that's why the building looks very similar, but when you get the old postcards of it, um, now here is obviously a post-fire picture, and we can see the trolley tracks coming down the street, some fascinating news on trolley. Anyone who knows me knows that I'm fascinated with the trolley. Dave and I did a trolley uh, talk some while back, and the one thing I've never been able to get is a piece of trolley track. See, they're buried under the street still because when the trolley ended, it was prior to World War II, so there was no need to get the steel for anything, and then after they were buried, it was too difficult to get it up. For years, these tracks keep getting exposed by PSE and G, but they refuse to cut them because they're so massive. But just a couple of weeks ago, a crew was doing some work on Franklin Avenue. I don't know if you noticed that it's been closed a little bit. And they found some tracks there, and they had to cut them. So I run up to the guy and say, where are the pieces? He goes, oh, three people came and they wanted them. We only had three pieces. My, my head almost exploded. I said, this can't be happening. 20 years I've been waiting. And so he went and he found the third person who was someone who just kind of was randomly interested and he took it from him and he gave it to me. So I have a piece of trolley track finally after 20 years. Um, but anyway, so this is the, this is the building after the fire. You can see that the uh, drug and ice cream store was there. Cramen, who did a lot of these postcards that, were see, that you'll see in the postcard collections and I go to postcard shows all the time. Cramen's was one of the sponsors and there, many of the postcards were from uh, James Cramen. Uh, uh, A and P, um, Atlantic Pacific Tea Company. There were several of those around town. Very, uh, very popular store. So this is a, this is a fascinating building, and it's still a, a very well maintained building today. If you don't know who this is, it's the Jim Dandies. And this is a great. This is one with actually the trolley running down the street with all the automobiles. Um, this is later on because we have two, we have trolleys going in two directions. Uh, at the beginning of it, Franklin Avenue was not quite as wide as this, but this is after the widening, and this is where you have a trolley coming uh, both directions. And cars and trolleys had to share the road. It was 
uh, a common thing. And uh, this is probably taken from the trestle, which also was something that had to be built to accommodate the trolleys because the train used to run at grade level at that spot, and they decided that was very bad. So this is probably taken from that shot, but it's wonderful to see the trolleys running through town. Um, I would love to see them still. It would have been a great asset. Okay, there's that first building that we saw, the, the Lambert building, commercial building, he built the side view of it there. So the just one or two more words about this building. It really was kind of the center of Nutley back then. They had a lot of different events going on there uh, through the 1910s, uh, before the fire, and then after the fire, when they had the third floor added, it really became a cultural center and an entertainment center, and it was a hall open for rentals. It was called Masonic Temple, Masonic Lodge. It was the Masons that owned the building at the time. There was an organ upstairs on the third floor, uh, a massive room on the, on the top level there. And if you were anybody in Nutley back in around 19, 15, 1920, they had minstrel shows uh, there, and people took turns dressing up and being, you know, doing a minstrel thing at that place. And a lot of the money that was made from the minstrel shows was used to create the Nutley Tennis Club, our tennis courts that are still in existence today. They're coming up on, I think, their 100 year anniversary. Uh, so there's just connections like everywhere. They're over uh, off of um, Maple Place, over by the railroad trestle, where the railroad trestle goes over Sake Avenue. We're going to cover that in an article uh, in Nutley Neighbors down the road. Okay, so all of you recognize this. I think everybody, I'm sure, has gone there at one time or another. Uh, it's now it's all um, Ralph's Pizza, but at one time, for those who have really been around a while, we had Plaza Bootery. Their first Matt Polito was in there. His dad was the first uh, shoe store. And on the left was John the Barber, which was Joanne Brown. Uh, her dad was there with the barber shop. I'm trying to get pictures from both families. I've not been successful yet, but I know they're there. So we're trying to get those to add to the show. So now we go, what was there before Rouse? He's been here since 1962. Is this mic okay? I don't know if I can hear a little bit. So we find Millard Farr was there with his insurance and real estate company. Now, if you know Jack Farr and Susan Farr in town, that's uh, Jack's grandfather. And Millard Farr, he was known to be a realtor who could sell anything. He had the gift of gab and the gift of advertisement. So he could take a house that was up on 20 stairs and tell you why you needed that house and why that was the best house that was on the market at the time and why to buy it. So he was known for selling houses, uh, hard to sell places, and he actually sold the same building sometimes two or three times using the same ads. The people would come back to him, well, I bought it from you, maybe somebody else will buy it. He received awards from the New York Times because he took out giant full page ads. He was into advertising, and he was awarded by New York Times many times for being an advertiser of the year. To further connect him, he, Joe Records worked for him, and Joe Records went on to create his own real estate group across the street in the Masonic Lodge. We talk about Records Realty. So there was like a spinoff you know, from his group. Okay, now most of you sort of recognize this now as Dr. Testis building, the podiatrist on East Plaza and Franklin Avenue. Okay, we always looked at, hmm, kind of has a church look about it, doesn't it? Because it was. Okay, it was a gospel church, and they started originally back in the 30s up on Olson Avenue in someone's home up there. And a lot of the churches did that back in the days. They met in people's homes uh, until the congregations grew and they wanted to get a better place. So they were growing, and they're an interesting congregation because they did not have a spiritual leader like we think of today. The men just took turns running the, uh, the sermons and running the show there. So they didn't really actually have a person in charge uh, back then. It was just like by committee. So they were on Olson Avenue. They were growing rapidly. They wanted to move. So in 1948, they found this piece of property down on, or on uh, Franklin Avenue and they built a building there. And they had different events there, dinners and uh, potluck dinners and Bible studies at night. And one of the things that was unique about the day they opened, they had their, they were so well funded that they had their grand opening and their mortgage burning on the same day. Oh, wow. So that was like their claim to fame. 
Now, the only piece of the puzzle I don't have is, I don't know what happened to the congregation. I don't know what year they went out exactly, but I do remember, you know, in the, probably in the 70s, sometimes the building being vacant for a while before uh, Dot Testa bought it up there. So if anybody has information on that, see me later. Sure. All right, so this is St. Paul's Church. Now, this was a, a Lambert project. Um, we're going to talk a lot about Lambert during this, uh, during our program here tonight. But let me just say, you know, Lambert was built, uh, was born in uh, 1869, and he designed and had this church built when he was only 27 years old. Um, he was actually just found out recently that he and his wife were actually married in it. And if there's one person that I really idolize in this town who's not around anymore is William Lambert. William Lambert is probably single-handedly the most responsible person for building up early Nutley, from really converting it from uh, a farm area to a, uh, a residential uh, place where people wanted to live. He utilized the train systems. He worked on a sort of a win-win basis. He didn't do something just to make profit. He did something that was good for the community, and then profit came his way. So this is one of the projects. Um, this is a very old picture. This is just before the church was officially opened. Um, it's always thought that Lambert's in this picture, but I don't believe he is. I've only seen two pictures of Lambert. He has built over 500 homes in Nutley. He has hundreds of homes built elsewhere across uh, many states, and I've only seen his picture twice, and I don't think he's in here. Um, but the church was a spin-off from the uh, Methodist, um, and in uh, 1898, the main church was built, and then in 1914, the parsonage was built. Um, you have more on the church. Let okay. me just do a little more on the church on the, the beginnings of it. Let me just grab that. So some of the things with St. Paul's, with the starting of it, uh, John mentioned it was a spinoff uh, from the Methodist church across the street here. So they had a, a small group that wanted to go on and do their own thing. So that was one of the reasons for St. Paul's to, to, for that to spin off from their group, theology reasons and all. The second was logistics. Now think about that side of town. We're talking about the north end of town. There are no churches anywhere on that side of town. Back in the 1800s, there still are no churches over there except for St. Paul's. So logistically, people wanted to have a church that they could either walk to or take their horse to or their carriage because it was even before automobiles. The trolley was running, but again, the trolley only came from that part of town for like a block or two from Kingsland Street. So logistics was a huge part that people wanted their own church. They had been in a house previously, like other congregations, and they wanted to be in a separate area. And it really became a, a really big operation uh, over the years, where in 1960, their membership grew to over 1,000 members, and they had over 300 uh, children in the Sunday school there. And throughout this time, they only had six uh, ministers because there was such continuity and such uh, um, money available over there that they, were, they kept the, their ministers for many years. There it was not a turnover there because they were very happy there and the people were very, very active. We have a few members here tonight, too, and Beverly and some other people, maybe. Okay, I just wanted to put that in there. Sure. Now, how many, actually, we didn't ask this, we should have. How many of you were actually on the walk that came? I'm just curious. Okay, so that's a pretty good amount. I was just curious about that. So Lambert's influence around town was everywhere. So we saw commercial buildings. We see a congregational church building here, which he did several churches. Um, he studied under the famous architect of Newark, uh, William Halsey Wood, and that's where he got his training from. And then he actually went out on his own at age 21. And the things that he's really left his legacy on is uh, the three developments that he did, which were Prospect Heights, Nutley Park, and then his last one, which was the Spring Garden section, where, you know, just as he was uh, phasing out of, out of building. And we owe a lot to Lambert for all that he's done for the town. And uh, this beautiful church here, when we had our walking tour, and if you, those of you are with us, we had it filled very nicely, and it was really kind of nice to see that. And they have a very wonderful little hallway of history of that church that uh, we walked up and down, and it's kind of difficult with 70 people, but we went through it. And it's just a beautiful, beautiful structure. The stained glass, they're looking for the history on the stained glass. No one has a really good, accurate sense of uh, 
of the history of that. So if anyone knows of that, we'd be very interested in that because if you look at it, it is just absolutely stunning. We were there at a time of day where the light was coming through and I cannot even explain the beauty of that church and the design. Oh, I didn't even know. Yeah, I've been going through it as you're talking. Oh, okay. So, um, yeah, the pictures do not do it justice. The, the woodwork, the, the beauty of the glass, uh, absolutely gorgeous. It was just a wonderful day to be in there and uh, I want to thank the congregation for allowing us to go through there like that. And, and they've been really good custodians too because the the whole of pictures they have there is incredible. There's pictures that go way, way back to the beginning and a lot of them have nameplates on them so they're complete pictures with identifications and years and all that. Uh, it's just a very unique church. I was doing some research trying to find some other similar type of construction. The only one I found was over in Chatham uh, on the internet, but it's no longer there, I believe, but it had the same type of look about it. And that was a congregational church also, so I don't know if that type of design was uh, something that they used, or Lambert may have been involved with it, or the other fellow from Newark. You know, but the stained glass is just everywhere, all the way around the sides. Uh, some of the glass on the left-hand side over here now, that's all up against the new building they put, the educational building that was built in 56. So those are now backlit, so they have uh, lights behind them, so we still keep a light in there. But there's nothing like the sunlight coming through. Uh, it's just absolutely gorgeous. And it faces to the east, so in the morning during services is when it's going to be you know, brightly lit for people to come in there. And most uh, windows are memorial windows of someone. You go down and you look at the bottom and they have uh, pictures or names, rather, of who the people were that it were dedicated to in their memory. Okay, one of the other things that they um, had, again, it was a, a powerhouse of ideas and people there. So over 50 years ago, Community Nursery School was started at St. Paul's. So they started in the basement there. They're still there today, 50 years later, and they have other outposts around. If they're across the street at the Methodist Church, and I guess they're over at uh, Grace Church, too. So they, they've been around for a long time, uh, put a lot of people through there over the years. Uh, I won't ask if anybody here was there, a student at any time, but I'll get somebody. And then this is just a parsonage. John mentioned this was built around 1914. We don't think that's a Lambert house. It doesn't have the look about it, uh, but it was built next door. So they, they were building, they were growing, they kept adding and adding. This is okay, so at one time, we had another lake in town and it was called Lake Lambert. So if you're on the north side of the trestle, on Hillside Avenue, there's a very large apartment building. I think it's 304 Hillside. It's a multi-story apartment building. Right across the street from that was a, there's the building, was a wonderful lake, and it was called Lake Lambert. He had it built and developed uh, to bring a little beauty to that end of town, to bring a little natural water. Because you've got to think about it, the Third River is coming down from uh, Nichols Falls and it runs through and it comes right through that area. And that was all exposed water for a while. And uh, the, the tragedy of the lake, and you could relate this to today, the reason they had to uh, drain and close it down was that kids were going through and taking all the park benches and throwing them into the water. So when you read the stories today and you go, what's wrong with kids today that they, well, in the 1930s, they were still doing the same thing. But this is the only picture that I'm aware of, of Lake Lambert. I don't ever have it on any maps or anything. It was very short lived, um, but it was right across from those uh, apartment buildings. And yeah, the apartment would be right there to the, to the, to the right there. And that's hillside that we see going over there. Okay, so this building also has uh, some Lambert history to it, but not directly. For a while, I thought that Lambert had actually built this building. He didn't, but oddly enough, his sister-in-law lived in it, and this is the building where <laughs> Mr. Lambert actually died. He went on vacation, as he always did, to Florida, he wasn't feeling well, he was only 69. He came back, and for whatever reason, he was staying in his sister-in-law's apartment. Uh, does anyone live here? What apartment? <laughs> 12. All right, 6, 6C. Yeah, 
right. So, so. I just want to make sure I don't want to bring in bad news. <laughs> the, the guy I love the most in Nutley died in your apartment. But, uh, but he passed away there. And um, uh, this building was actually built uh, by another architectural firm. I'm really not sure how that all worked out. How some, I, I always get the feeling that anything that was built around that time, Lambert had involvement with. But he was not the architect or the builder of these buildings. But he did die in this building where his sister-in-law lived. And it's actually quite a beautiful building. Um, but it was shortly after this was built, I think in 38, that the, the, the lake was filled and they uh, got rid of it. Now there's just structures, houses on it. It's over sort of in that area too where the gymnastics world is, that, that lower area over there. Uh, this is our group uh, walking. There's now, um, Dave, you know more about the culvert than I will. You want to talk about the culvert? Yeah, I'm going to get into that. Yeah. Just finish up and then three or four hillside, of course, has become a cell tower. As we make sure our cell phones work. So that's one of the earlier high points in town where they have the antennas up on top there. Uh, a really good old building. Actually, we have an ad for it, I thought. Yeah, it's I thought the Here it there it is. Yeah. That's the builders. Um, so I don't know how it worked, but somehow I think Lambert may have even sold them the land because it's odd to me that he owned all that land in that area. And uh, so I, I'd imagine somehow he had something to do with this. But look at, the, uh, look at all the... Uh, uh, amenities that you had here. You had large outs all outside rooms, 24 hour elevator service, uh, mechanical refrigeration, Murphy in a door beds, uh, kitchenettes, and it was going to be ready for occupancy, it says, in September 1st. Rents 50 to 150 per month. Isn't that great? <laughs> Went up a little since then, I guess. Just a little bit. <laughs> it was a great old building. I mean, I had some experience with the building too. Of course, when I had my paper out, I had customers in there that I delivered to. Uh, nice people, they were good tippers too. And the um, other thing on the fire department during that time, for a while there, we had a couple small fires in a few of the apartments that we had to deal with over the years. But the building is so well made, it's one of those fireproof buildings they talk about. So the walls were cement and heavy plaster and all that. So we were able to keep the fire within the dwelling units where the fires occurred there. So. It worked good. The elevator always worked great. Um, good old mechanical elevator with the big gate in the front of it and all that. So let's just go back to the culvert. So one of the things that a lot of people don't realize is that the when the water comes down from Nichols Park down to Nutley Lumber Yard and behind that area and down through Hillside Avenue, point where we showed the lake a couple minutes ago, at that point the river goes underground. There's a culvert that was built there back in 1955 and it's we're standing on it right there. It's under Franklin Avenue all the way through here. It runs across Franklin Avenue down through between the apartments under the parking lot down under Elm Place and then comes out behind the Anacol School. So that was a culvert that was put in there to help with flooding and all that. We're going to see why they did this or what the attempt was even though we still get flooding there from time to time uh, because it's just so much water nowadays coming through. So we're actually going to see a picture with the construction of that. So here we are today. This is the first apartment building, Franklin Avenue, just kind of across from Naples. Naples is the new restaurant there, Ross Deli. Across the street is the first building in North American Eagle built in town. This is on the east, east side of Franklin Avenue. Okay, and this is what was there before. It was called the Fort Knightley Club. And this was built by Lambert uh, back around 1900. The porch is what they call a Louisiana pillared porch. And that was done for design purposes. It was designed as a social club. They had bowling alleys in there, they had a stage, they had card rooms, the porch to hang out on. And it was, Lambert was into social clubs. We're gonna see another one that he built too, because he built a community, not just homes. He was here to build everything, to make it a community that would be lived in, enjoyed and people could stay here and had recreational time. So he was big on the recreation. So the, the Fortnightly Club was, was really a, a centerpiece for a long time. And we have, let's see, one more picture. Here's another picture, a little more. And then we see here that the river is still wide open here. What street is that? The Franklin Avenue. Franklin Avenue. Avenue. Yeah. Right across from Naples Pizzeria. Right. So we see the river there, Saint, some people call it St. Paul's Brook, Springer Brook, there's all different names for it. But here's where it was, there's a parking lot, parking lot here now for the apartment building over here. <coughs> so now, 
St. Paul's Church now, which is just half a block up the street, is growing. They need more space. So in 1920, they buy this building and start to use it for Sunday school and for their recreational purposes. So in 1920, they take this over you know, from Lambert and they use it, so now they have two different buildings going. 1942, St. Paul's is still there. This is from the 42 film we showed uh, two months ago. We used that as a blood bank during World War II. So they, you know, it's a community building used by a lot of people. Then we get into some interesting history. Okay, we just found this. We did not have this information on the walk. In 1955, there was a fire in the building. Now this building has been through a lot of trauma over the years. It's been flooded several times. The porches were washed off the, uh, uh, off the front there. So this fire now is on a Sunday. There was Sunday school going on. People were in church. Little kids playing with matches. They're building the new building, the educational building, behind the St. Paul's Church the same year. They're getting ready to open that. So they have furniture stored in this building for the new addition. People are in church, and a fire starts from a kid playing with matches uh, who didn't report it in the front. So the fire gets a head start, and it became kind of difficult. The, the minister kept the service going. It's like, you know, the show must go on. You know, you see people running out, people are talking. Uh, they still kept it going. And the people now are, you know, trying to find their kids and get around. And nobody got hurt. We were lucky on that. But what we do see here, and this is a bonus part of the picture, is the construction of the culvert that's going under Franklin Avenue that we just talked about. It was going on that same day, so the fire department couldn't get to the building. They had to go up and around the block out to Kingsland and come back and circle around to get to it. So it really became quite a fiasco. But the building was saved. They put the fire out. The building was saved and restored. Uh, went on later, 19... 78, it was sold to the Nutley Italian American Club. They had that for a clubhouse and they did their thing there. They had a small fire from electrical in there. And later on, it was Master Poe was in there with a karate studio. He got flooded out, almost drowned. Uh, and then eventually the building was torn down and um, re reconstructed. Okay. So, you want to do this one? That's the Yeah, so this, this house here, <laughs> You guys know where this is? This is where the Wishing Well Florist used yeah. to be? Well, that house that is attached to that is actually one of the oldest homes in Nutley called the Eastman House. Um, it's from the late 1700s, and it's absolutely astounding that house that age is still here. I mean, we have our brownstones in Nutley, but there are very few homes from the 1700s uh, that are still around, and, th and this being one of them, and actually it'd be, one of my hopes one day that, that someone would go and strip the siding off of it and, and, and maybe just, you know, I'd love to just to get a tour of the basement of it because typically houses from that time, they would just take trees for the, um, for the floor beams and just hone one side flat and nail the flooring on top of it. Um, you would knock on the door, John? Yeah, well, <laughs> might want to. Um, but yes, this is this is one of the oldest structures. Now there's one other old uh, 1700s house. It's on uh, I believe it's on Freeland Avenue. And then after that, you know, we have a bunch from the 1840s or so. But this this house here uh, has a, a lot of history to it, and was one of the first wood structure homes in in Nutley that shows on early maps. Okay, now this is a. Glendale and Franklin, we're just gonna do a real quick on a trolley, because this was in that area. So this is Glendale Street coming up the hill towards Franklin Avenue, you're heading westbound. And we have that same picture from 100 years ago or so with the trolley coming up through the loop uh, on Glendale, the Glendale Loop, which the town fought that for a long time. For those who remember our trolley history, it took eight years for the town to approve that loop so that we could turn the trolley around in Nutley and head it back to Balboa and down toward Newark. Otherwise, it had to go all the way to Patterson, or at least the sake before it could turn around. So that's the Broadline trolleys coming up there. These are pictures that we found after we did the trolley show. We found a book with some more pictures. <coughs> then we're going back. This is uh, Kingsland and Franklin again. Uh, the new Dunkin' Donuts is over here. Help you acclimate where you are. And this is the trolley coming northbound on Franklin Avenue, getting ready to make the right onto Kingsland Street. And we, we see our nice little keep slow, keep right thing going here, kid on the bike. And it was interesting that 
the reason that Kingsland Road is so narrow is because of the property owners that lived along that route would not give up land for the trolley because they really don't want it going that way. So we're still suffering from the narrowness of that area of Kingsland Street because of the farm owners that were in that area back then and didn't want to give the land up. And also remember too, the trolley was never meant to come down Franklin Avenue. Franklin Avenue was a residential, narrower street with homes on it, like the Eastman home and other houses. It was only the decision to not allow it to go down Passaic Avenue, which was where it was supposed to go. And if you look on a map, it would make much more sense. But there was a, a homeowner there who was a lawyer, had some influence, and he convinced them that he would not want that trolley coming down Passaic Avenue, which at the time was the center of town. That was our old town center. That's where the stores were. That's where people went. So it made sense for the trolley to go there. They didn't want it to, so they diverted to Franklin Avenue. And then what happens as a natural course? Franklin Avenue starts to develop because as the trolley comes down, now you have customers, people want to buy things. So less and less houses on Franklin Avenue, more and more businesses. Actually, they just tore down one of the last, there's a couple left, but they tore down a really nice one recently, right on the north side of the uh, trestle um, to, you know, to develop it, I understand it. But uh, that was one of the last you know, old time houses there. And that's really, the trolley changed a lot in town. I just want you to keep that in mind. We did talk about that on our, our talk. All right, so now we're making a left onto Kingsland Street, heading west uh, up toward the Roach property, prison property. So this is the building that's there now. It's a group home. And this is what was there back then. And we posted this on Facebook. This is from 1956. So this is a newer picture of what we have. But Facebook has been, and social media has been a good source of information of stories and memories from people. So we did find out that Mr. Glick used to own this and people that uh, we spoke with that lived in the area and shopped there. Back in those, uh, the 50s, even into the 60s, you had a lot of small grocery stores, neighborhood stores. People could get their meats, their breads, their vegetables, uh, all the things. Just send a kid down to the store with a buck and bring home you know, things for dinner. So they always had fresh foods. And most of them had uh, butcheries of some type. They were all well trained in that and a lot of fresh things. So that's what uh, that became a group home later on. So now. Okay, so. It's very hard to get a shot with this, and I can't complain, you know, like, what am I going to say? Oh, there's so many trees, I can't get a picture of a house, so that's a good thing for Nutley. But this, in the background there, that's Lambert's actual house. So Lambert didn't just work in Nutley, he didn't just develop Nutley, he lived here. He raised his family here. That's a much better shot of the house because the street was pretty new back then. This is on Cathedral Avenue, so when you turn, you know, off of Kingsland, and there's that little triangular property there, and you're heading over to Route 3. Lambert's house is there, and it's still there, and it has this wonderful bell roof to it. Um, if you look at Lambert houses, he went through a lot of phases. When we showed you that first commercial one, I should have pointed out to you, it was stucco, and there was these little triangles and diamonds. And that was a thing that he did on a lot of his stucco work. Um, for his homes, he liked to do a lot of turrets, towers. Um, you can almost... At this point, I can almost look at a house now and know if it's a Lambert house. But his is very unique because I haven't seen another house with a bell quite like this. And this was his own uh, private home. Again, the history of the, the uh, development of postcards came about. Uh, they've been around for a long time, but the real heyday for them was 1890 to like 1915. So a lot of the shots I have, many of the images I have of early Nutley are all coming from postcards, and this is a wonderful postcard. And there was a whole series called the Picturesque Nutley Series. And they went around town and took pictures of the nicest homes and stores, and Lambert was involved with this. So some of these postcards on the back, you know, he was a businessman, which just, by the way, happened to have how great Nutley was, how many feet of flag sidewalks we have, how many improved roads we have, and of course was his phone number and the average price of some houses that you could buy. So I think this is one of those cards. Okay, so now, now we get into the... Uh, okay, so now we go into the Lamont property. And this is, um, as it looks today, area in need of development. It's been cleared off. This is on Kingsland Street, across from where the fork in the road is. You go to the right, if you stay to the left, and head on towards the old Roach property. This is across the street. And we have some pictures that were taken. Andy Bucchino gave us this picture in the back. Thank you, Anthony. And this is a picture of the door. This is the original 
uh, office building uh, up on top. And then this is the building, some of you may remember the water tower and the building that was there, just to kind of, it's all gone now, it's just a memory. The family got in touch with us a couple months ago, one of the Lamont uh, grandsons, and he wanted to come to Nutley to see his grandfather's factory. I said, it's not there anymore, but we'll give you pictures. So we get pictures. And then this is the railroad siding, because uh, they had their own um, rail service coming in for boxcars and all. And this is the building when they first started. The Kingsland paper mills were there first. So Joseph Kingsland had his paper mill across the Kingsland Manor, and he moved up the street here and made a, a larger facility. And then Lamont came along with his patent, and Lamont was involved with safety paper. He had a patent how to make checks safe and stock certificates and lottery tickets and all the things that had to be protected from forgery. So the two of them merged uh, their all their specialties and it became, Lamont took over, it became the Lamont Safety Paper Factory. Uh, at one time it controlled 75% of the market in the world. And there's a separate show we did on this a while back I did with, um, with Eric Fader. You can see that on YouTube if you want more on that. And then after their um, expansion, they really made it extra big. Um, you know, the Sawtooth Roof on there and uh, just a really big place. That's a courtesy to historical society. Now we go across the street. You wanted to uh, just be. Okay, so an interesting little bit of Nutley history is that for the longest time we had a gentleman named Eaton Stone who lived over by on the Roche property. So we're looking across to the building that they call the chapel. Eaton Stone had a house there, but there wasn't just a house, there was a quarry at one time. Nutley was filled with quarries, Nutley was a quarry town. Uh, many of the fine, much of the finest brownstone that was ever quarried out and sent to New York was from Nutley. Um, but he also, the thing Eaton Stone is really known for is that he was a circus performer. He ran away at the age of eight to go join the circus. His father actually had to go sue the person who he ran off with uh, to get his child back. And then he ran away again at like 10 or 12. And Eaton Stone and his brother, Den, uh, they ended up both being in the circus. Eaton Stone was a famous uh, bareback horse rider, and his brother turned out to be a famous circus clown, and they toured with many circuses for many years. And Eaton Stone on this property had a circular building that was used to train horses. And it was in that building that we had the Nutley Amateur Circus in which Annie Oakley performed, because Annie Oakley was a Nutley resident. She lived on Grant Avenue. She lived here for about 10 to, 10 to 12 years. And they put on a show for the benefit of the Nutley Red Cross to raise money for it. And Eaton Stone, um, he was said to have been, see when you read his biography or when you read stories about him, he's telling it as an elderly person, he was in his 80s, and he had a little bit of uh, em embellishment to his life. So at one point he said he was kidnapped by Indians for three years, and he was trained by them to, to, to be a horse master. So uh, he was a pretty interesting guy, and he lived right here in Nutley on the property where Roche is now. If you can see here, um, the quarry was so big that it actually had its own rail sidings coming off of it. So the railroad line that passed through would have that siding and it would go over to the quarry. And um, the Eaton Stone House no longer exists um, because of the whole Roche development. but. Um, it was a brownstone quarry. There wasn't the biggest one we had in town. Most of the better ones we had were down closer to the Passaic River. Uh, but it's just interesting that we have this tie-in with Annie Oakley, these quarries, and this famous circus rider. And if you come up later, I have an actual uh, flyer from England from the like late 18, mid to late 1800s where they're doing a benefit for him. And I want you to come up and take a look at that. It's one of some of the memorabilia we have up here today. And then, of course, uh, when that property was sold, Roche purchased it. This is the, uh, the, the sort of the groundbreaking for Roche being built. It's a wonderful picture. I love this shot. Uh, look at the uh, furs and the hats. Uh, it's, just, it's just so, that, and the steam shovel too. I'm, I'm, I'm into stuff like that, so I think this is just a terrific shot. And of course, Roche you know, went on to become one of our, our biggest uh, companies ever. You know, Building One, the iconic Building One, which I miss a great deal. I wish that could have been so, you know, saved as part of the uh, 
process, but they owned a great deal uh, of land there, and this is where the quarries and Eaton Stone's circus tent was, where Annie Oakley did perform for the benefit of Nutley. Okay, the next um, area we're going to talk about, these are called the Ten Commandments. And these are a series of ten identical houses. I just took a newer picture of an aerial uh, from Google to show so you can understand where they are. This is on Bloomfield Avenue. To the right, all the way over here is Oakley, Oakley uh, Restaurant or the Old Park Pub. So these go to the south. So those were built for the Nichols Hat Factory when he moved his operation from Newark and built the factory. We're going to talk about that in a couple minutes. This is where a lot of his employees moved to. He was able to allow them to uh, take ownership of the land, and he wanted each one identical so there was no competition, I guess, between the people. But it's uh, famous. And there's some people in Nutley that I've talked to that lived in the houses, and they were you know, small two-bedroom houses, but they were housing you know, for people, their own little house and their own little yard. And they could walk to work. It was great. And later on, people from Lamont's paper mill lived there, and after that, people from Roach lived there. So it really kind of a hat trick for these houses. They've served the community well over the years. Again, we, we got to take our pictures in the winter when there's no leaves, but these are just a frontal view of the houses. So you understand where they are across the ball field at Nichols Park. And then we see the, uh, the 10 houses here uh, that were built. And this we're discussing now, we think this was the sandpaper factory for Nichols, the sons of the Nichols Hat Factory, the sons of the owner had a sandpaper factory. We think it may have been there. And we're thinking now we have to look a little closer. It may be the Oakley building where Oakley is now, because the location's the same. Okay, so this is the 800 Bloomfield. Um, this was the hard to get good pictures again because we can't get the angles. But this is the 800 Bloomfield. Uh, this is where the Recchio building in the later years, Nelly's son was in there, uh, the eighth floor restaurant, uh, OBC Studios, a number of apartments upstairs. And this was what was their um, second, actually, uh, Black Prince was the second occupant there. The Nichols Hat Factory was there first. And that was custom built. And you can see there was an old mill building uh, built around the time where there was not a lot of electric. So a lot of windows were put in for light and ventilation. And certainly in a hat factory, you want ventilation if you know anything about the production of hats. Uh, it was good to open a window. But look at the gorgeous op uh entrance here, a little brownstone in here, all carved. A lot of that is still there. You can go up there and you can still see a lot of this work is still there. That's 800 Bloomfield Avenue, the, across from the Oakley. You go down that long parking lot. Oh, yeah. Down in the Orecchio building. You know, Orecchio lived there. Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. okay, so this gives us kind of a map of the layout here. Uh, I don't know what year this was, John. 1906. 1906. So we see the Kingsland paper mills are already there. We see the Nichols Hat Factories here. We see Nichols Pond. So we get an idea of, of construction going on in that area in industry. And then I took some, I'm trying to get the back of the 800 Bloomfield, uh, but the trees are in the way, but this is what I was trying to get. Because that's the back of that building we just saw, the Black Prince Nichols Hat Factory. And this is the pond or the lake that used to be there. And now we're going, getting down close to the dam. So I'm going to pass this one to you, John. This is your specialty. Okay, so we talked about Nichols Hat Factory, and Dave mentioned how you had to have windows because you know no electric for fans or stuff. But interestingly enough, Nichols Hat Factory was the first producer of public power for Nutley in 1893. Very early, Nichols Hat Factory had turbines in their factory. And those turbines produced surplus electricity, enough so that they contracted with the town of Nutley. And I think the first contract was for, I believe, 100 streetlights. And it was for $1,400 a year. The Nichols factory would keep those streetlights going. And that arrangement lasted up until the point where uh, public service came and bought them out. But it's just interesting to see that uh, that as early as 1893, we had street lighting in town. Now, the only other town that really had that in this area at that time was certain sections of Newark. Belleville didn't get it until later on. Bloomfield didn't get it until later on. Um, so it was very interesting to read this. And the contract was kept up for years. I think eventually 
they worked their way up to it's either 250 or 300 lights total, and they would keep them running. And contrary to belief, the they used the river to incorporate these generators, but it wasn't a turbine where the water turned the turbine. The water was used for a steam turbine. So the waters, Third River water came off of Nichols Pond. It went into a steam turbine. The steam turbine pr produced enough electricity for the Nichols Hat Factory, and that surplus was sold off to Nutley. Very interesting to read that we were one of the first Essex County towns to ever have public street lighting. Now, this, you hear me refer to um, Nichols Lake and Nichols Pond, and when we think of it now, and we go back to that baseball field and we look, we go, you know, what are we really talking about? Because it's so narrow. That area that we see, that pond, lake, was three times wider, minimum three times wider than it, what it used to be. It was an actual real lake because um, there was actually many things that ran off it. The Nichols Hat Factory used the water to run their steam turbines. This lake was also, in the winter, used to cut ice. It was an ice uh, harvesting lake. You would cut the ice, and you would bring it to what's called an ice house, which the Kingsland actually owned an ice house in Clifton. And you, if you stored the ice properly, it's almost like when you see, you know, after a snowstorm and like three months later, you'll see certain parking lots that have the banks and the snow is still there. If you store ice properly, you can cultivate, you can harvest it in the winter, you can keep it in a building, and you can have it for almost the whole year. So Nichols Lake or Nichols Pond, I looked up today to see what the difference was. There was no difference. You can use it interactively. Um, was much, much larger than what it is now, what you see today. That's an old tree. <laughs> it was probably there during the hat factory. I just saw it there. And it Mr. Nichols used to run into that tree with his carriage <laughs> and curse it out. There we go. That's just the information. Okay, and this is the, yes, yeah, so, yeah, so you see they had a contract for a cost of $1,400. Uh, they would run the lights for the year, and that contract was renewed year after year. I have town committee reports that show that they were, the town was very happy with the uh, with the arrangement, and that arrangement kept on until the point that public service uh, took over and bought out uh, Nichols' uh, interest in uh, making electricity for the town. Yeah, yeah this is just showing again that in 1898, public service took over the, uh, the idea of t making electricity for the streetlights. And Nichols was they were uh, liquidating the property. Nichols was liquidating the property also, so the, the lake and some of the land around it became the first part of Nichols Park as it was deeded over to the township. So the, many of the parks came from all different sources of uh, property owners over the years, but Nutley, again, one of those things that makes Nutley great was the foresight to continually expand the park system and acquire land whenever it became available all along the river. So we didn't have building along the river, so we didn't have flooding problems, you know, where it would impact homes or businesses. And then we were able to, I call it our, our mini manifest destiny. We go from Belleville to Clifton uh, with a park system, our park belt along the river. And not too many towns can attest to that. So this is the um, John's favorite area in all of Nutley. Uh, this is the, we're gonna show a couple other angles. This is the dam there that made Nichols Lake. And again, the trees are in the way here a little bit, so we'll go through those quick. So John got this picture. We can see that's our dam that was there. Uh, it's been through a lot of, looks like it got blown up a few times. It's been repaired quite a bit, uh, So, but it's still holding the water back and doing its job there. And then this is John when he was a kid. <laughs> so, so he was playing there even back then. Um, so this is a uh, a cut and paste type thing we believe because we're going to see in the next picture that one of the kids is missing. <laughs> one over here he's missing that. But look how great that waterfalls looked back then and all that. So I still had the railing up top and all. So the next thing of course we have to show um, Lambert, another Lambert building. This is a firehouse on High Street just off Bloomfield Avenue, host too. And this was built um, back during, right around 1900, because we're gonna show the next couple of pictures we're gonna see. And the, note the building hasn't changed all that much, you'll see, let's take a quick look. And we go in the building, there's not a lot of difference, it's still pretty intact, uh, we've kept it up. Uh, in the back, 
there was where the horses were because we had horse drawn. We'll see them in the next picture. So we'd have horse drawn fire wagons coming out of there. We had attendants there for the horse in the back. Uh, I used to know the name of the horse, but I can't remember it now. So one of my secretaries just go down and pet the horse or something. She told me. But it was, uh, it's still in use today. The doors have been changed, but it's still pretty much intact. Go the back way it is. I don't know what this kid did, but there's a little kid in the window there who wasn't allowed to come out for the picture, so I don't know if he caused any trouble. I always see him back there and feel so bad for him. <laughs> now, Lambert could be one of those people in the front there, but again, he's so hard to identify on, on the previous card. He, uh, he could actually be there. I don't know if that's him. Again, uh, I have very few identified pictures of Lambert. so. And then, of course, we had that picture was colorized and it was used up at the bank at the top of Darling and Kingsland. When Commerce Bank first went in, they were doing murals from around town, so they selected that as one of theirs. And they, uh, it's in, on that wall, hopefully, for a long, many years to come. Uh, Roach Credit Union did some, old, some more modern pictures, but they have them also. Component it is now. I date myself. But you want to? Okay, so now, now we're down in Nutley Lumber Yard. This is where Home Away From Home is. Uh, Nova Electric used to be there. Uh, Gymnastics World, Bitten Brothers Power Equipment, Nutley Lumber Yard. I'm trying to name, trying to help people understand where this is. So if we go um, down the little hill from Hillside Avenue, it's in the back, it's an industrial park, it's down in the hole. You can't see it from anywhere except when you're down in there. So this is kind of what it looks like when today. It was Nutley Lumber Yard, it's uh, disbanded now but they were known for their dry lumber and, and good lumber, so the carpenters like to go there because the lumber is always dry and ready to go. A lot of it came in by rail. Uh, we're gonna see some of the evidence of that. Uh, this is just what it's like. It's pretty run down back there now. The rest of the complex is all developed now. This is just the last little area they have to sell off. The Weber family was the ones that owned it at the end. So, this is a great picture of that same area, and this is when it was a coal yard and supply house. So we can see that it's, everything's horse drawn in this picture, so we know it goes way back. So they had, in the, in the back here is the rail line, just to help you acclimate where you are. And then behind that is High Street going up the hill. So we have uh, coal here coming in by train. We have things here, and a lot of the coal was delivered in bags to houses, because a lot of the houses, they couldn't set the chutes up at the houses, so they had to carry it in bag by bag. Uh, so that, that was a, a tough job back then, being a coal deliver guy, because you had to bring it um, as many bags as you could get in, I guess, so you ran out of gas, you know, and, and the people paid you. We al also have a, it's hard to see in this picture, but that wagon there says artificial ice on it. Mm -hmm. So this was an ice wagon, artificial ice being the term they used the next step after the harvesting from the lake John talked about. They started to make ice houses were starting to come into faction as they got, they weren't electric yet. They were chemically operated with ammonia systems and all. They were able to make ice artificially year round. So they called it artificial ice at the beginning. Made with ammonia, uh, when your ice cube melted, it left a nice little white thing inside your water and stuff like that. It wasn't the healthiest kind of ice cube back then. That had come a long way since then. Uh, but just a great old picture. And, uh, I thank John, I never saw this picture up until like two months ago. I didn't know this one existed, so it's great. One of the best ones, not Yeah. It just shows how all the, the businessmen and commerce people really built up over the years to service the people as the town grew. So we see uh, Jacob Kears to the coal yard. We see his, uh, he's got his little branch rail coming off the side here. It's a little, uh, coming in with the coal so they could drop it. The other coal yard, too, was down on Park Avenue, uh, Hawkins, but we're only going to stay in this section of town today. And then we still see, you know, more of the sidings coming in off the rail, you know, going, and then we see the, what we're going to talk about next, we see the West Nutley Station here, the High Street Railroad Station, as more of us know it as, but here's the siding going into that area. Can you go back one picture, there was, a, there was something that's a daily on it, see it on the right there? Down the, the daily? Dr. Dr. S. Daly. I wonder if that daily shoot, that's where I live, is it named after him? It is probably, it probably is named after him, yes. Dr. S. Daly. Yes. Wow. Owned yeah. a lot of property in town. Learned something new, wasn't it? We actually, I'm just looking at this now, we see poultry yard over here, it looks like. I didn't just notice that now. So that was kind of cool over there. And then we see Franklin Depot was what the railroad station, railroad station was called originally because it was more of a freight depot when it first opened up before the passenger service came in. Are those tracks on, on Kingsland Avenue? Oh, the 
Avenue. Yeah, that's a, that's the same rail line that's that goes across Kingston. Yeah. yeah, that's the same line. It's not currently in use right now. And then now that we're going to Hillside Avenue. This is today. This is a Lambert building. Okay, this is, as it was built back in the day, it was called either the Hillside or the Franklin Club, were the two different names that we find it under. So it was built as a social hall. Again, Lambert's looking to have those recreational areas. So this was built as a recreation area. St. Paul's actually met there before their building was built. That was one of their meeting halls that they used as a congregation group. And today it's used as a rooming house. Uh, don't know exactly what year that occurred, but it's uh, undergone a lot of different owners through the years and a lot of shady characters, but it's uh, cleaned up pretty good now. So less rooming house that we have in Dudley of that size, all the other ones are been torn down, thankfully. And this one is um, <coughs> East Plaza actually being uh, constructed. We see St. Paul's Church over here before the educational building. We see the Hillside Club here. And we see this is Hillside Avenue coming down from Kingsland. And then this is the road being built coming in there. This is probably taken from up on the railroad tracks, you know, looking down the embankment. All right, one of the, uh, no. one of what I think is one of the great losses in town was the train stations. We had three in town. We had a uh, station over by St. Mary's Church. We had one on uh, Whitford and Highfield, and we had the Franklin Station, which was roughly in this location. That's Montclair Radiology to the right there. Um, there's two things that I credit the development of Nutley with, and one is the railroad, which came in around 1868, which changed everything for us. It made us, it took us off the, off the local map into the uh, big city map because now you could live in Nutley and take a train ride of 45 minutes or less for you know, 11 miles and work in New York and then come back home to Nutley. The train changed that. The other thing I credit is William Lambert. So this is where sort of the two meet because William Lambert, and we'll go into this in a second, had offices across from the rail station, but the the early stations were very primitive, very rough looking, um, very uh, commercial, industrial. And what Lambert did, again, it, this, is real, this is really smart, let me put my notes down. Really smart thinking on his part. He, he understood that people were gonna come to town. So what he did was where he built his offices, which would be across the street, he at his own cost built this station. He tore down the old station. He said, if people are coming to town, they need to see how beautiful the town is. So he built this beautiful sort of, I, I, I almost called Spanish style. It had, uh, had the, uh, the ceramic tile roof on it, had that beautiful stucco front to it. Um, again, he could be in this picture, I don't know. But his one great gimmick was that he would have a car, which is, you know, there were cars around at the time when he was working, but they weren't really prevalent. But he would have a car outside the station, and if you wanted to, you could get a tour of Nutley, and of course, I'm sure it would take you around every single lot that he had for sale. This is, now, <laughs> this is a Lambert map up here. You can see how he did it. He had his lots laid out, and, uh, and he would color them in when they sold a piece of land, and they had a little house stamp that they would stamp when they actually built the house on it. So he was pretty smart in knowing that you can't get people to buy into your town unless your town looks beautiful. And he, he did something else that is not related so much to our tour, but in the park system, he purchased one of the areas along the river, a park area. He leased it from the town for three years, gave the town money, and what he did at that time was he developed it. He put benches in, bushes in, all this stuff, cleaned it up, and then when he was done, he turned it back over to the town. He didn't make a penny off of doing that, but he wanted the improvements of the town. This is a terrific shot of a steam train pulling into that station. The train was so used at that time, it was a main artery to get people to and from in and out of Nutley. And um, it ran for almost 100 years from when it started uh, to the time it closed down. And I think it's one of Nutley's greatest losses that we let that train go. And people ask all the time, can we reincorporate it? The system's cut up too much, especially down in Newark. You'll never really be able to connect that train line again. 
Uh, but this is one of the best features that we ever had in town was this, was this train station. When did it go out? Uh, I think it was around, around 1968 or so. And uh, they tore down the little beautiful train station, the one that was uh, on Whitford. Um, that was just a gorgeous one, but again, it was torn down because kids kept breaking into it, and the town just felt, well, it's easier just to take it down. But that was an adorable little station. But this was, no, this was Lambert's home area. Um, this is the area that we're calling Lambert Square now, which fortunately the Nutley Community Preservation Partnership, which is sort of defunct now, but they have gone out and they are going to put an official plaque in recognizing Lambert uh, for, this is, this is a later picture. This is just around the time where it's just starting to phase out. You know, what happens with everything else, like you know, with our movie theaters and this or that, you, people just go a different way for a while and it's in that point where you lose something. I always say there's, when something's new you appreciate it and then it gets old and you let it go and then 20 years later you go, wow, I wish I had that again because now it's worth something. So this is Lambert's office. This is uh, 11 High Street. Um, Glamour and Glitz wasn't there at the time. <laughs> he put his offices there because it was the central part of town. This is where the train stopped. This was the nicest train stop in town. People would come off. He had his real estate business there. He did one of the coolest things ever, and it's been written about in papers all across. He created, and I brought it here for you to look at. He created these little booklets called Nutley in a Nutshell. And they were sales brochures and you opened it up and it had pictures of some of the homes he built. It talked all about town and let you know how many paved roads there were, what the electric uh, and sewer line conditions were, how many sidewalks we had. And it was a brilliant little booklet that people would send away for even if they had no intention of living in Nutley. These still turn up every now and then, but he was a community guy. He wanted to build a community and um, he did that by, he had offices in New York too, he worked a lot in New York, but this was his home office uh, and this was his hometown. That's our last, that's the last slide. So if there's, if there's any person that should be celebrated, it's William Lambert because he has touched almost every single part of this town. We've only covered the northwest section of Nutley in this tour, uh, but he has been everywhere. And I'm so glad to hear that Lambert Square will now officially have a plaque dedicated to him. I'm trying to see if we can create a William Lambert Day, just an honorarium day to, to say on the calendar, this is the day where we should uh, uh, commemorate a guy who put so much time and effort into Nutley. And a lot of this walk that Dave and I did, we couldn't believe as we're walking around, like, wow, that has a Lambert connection. Wow, that has a Lambert connection. So you can almost call this a Lambert walking tour also, but uh, it's been wonderful and uh, I hope that uh, you enjoyed it and I'm gonna let Dave do the closing. It's just, just one or two more things on Lambert, I know we're running a little over. The, uh, one of the um, best things about his development in my mind, so he did like Nutley Park section, he did a Prospect Heights, uh, those were two of his bigger ones. He, bought up property and made the streets, made the sidewalks, laid the sewer lines, built a sewer plant in Kingsland Park when the town couldn't get their act together and build their own sewer plant. So he built it at his own expense until the town got the public sewers made. And then up on Prospect Street, when he was selling off the lots for people for development, he sold every other lot off for development. And he left the, the lots in between vacant in hopes that the people on either side would buy the lot and split it up because he wanted to maintain the openness of the town, maintain the trees that were there, the old trees, the old growth, and so he knew that things, we needed space in the town. So he really tried. He was, I think, ahead of his time as far as making a beautiful community. If you think about how the streets are through the Nutley Park section, which is over, you know, Highfield Lane, Saturday, over through that section, how beautiful that area is, how many of the houses uh, are laid back uh, on the property, they're not right up on the curb. There's no cookie cutter houses going in those areas. So he really did a lot to make the town, to give it the character that it has. And I don't know any other developer that worked in town that, that really did as much as he did. Uh, so we do we really do owe him a lot. Um, some of the design features on the houses is that he had to make sure, supposedly every house was different, and that there were no uh, imitation of the next house in another neighborhood. So each house was individually made he had helpers, he had to have help. There was no way he could have done it all himself, so he had other staff members. But one of the things that his houses were noted for was each one had a den. 
So he was thinking about main caves before he was even term. The den was in the house for the men of the house, fireplace, place for big stuffed chairs. Uh, he wanted bearskin bear rugs and animal skins and deers on the heads on the wall and all that. He wanted to make a real man area you know, for them to have. And then he wanted yards around the houses too so the kids could play in the yards. So he was trying to make everything family oriented and, and make the house valuable, but yet affordable because the houses were pretty affordable for what we've seen in the ads. 3,500 to yeah. 5,000. Right, so that's, that, even that was a lot of money back then, but it was like, you know, like what it would be today. Um, you know, like a oh. 400,000 house, maybe maybe right. 500, yeah, so, right. which is where Nutley is in that range, you know, for, for nicer, bigger homes. So, thank you. Thank you so much.